Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. For those just tuning in this month, we are diving deep into the issue of ocean plastics. So talking to scientists, uh, explorers, even artists from around the world who are uh, shedding light on this important issue, as well as uh, looking for solutions that we can use now, especially for the problem of single use plastics. So before we meet our guests for today, I wanna to take a quick moment to give a shout out to our classrooms who are tuning in live on YouTube. Just because you're on YouTube doesn't mean you can't get in on the action. If you look over on the right, you'll find the chat sidebar. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself, shoot some questions at us, and I'll make sure I work some of them uh, into today's event. And of course, for any classroom, whether you're on camera or joining us live on YouTube, so take some pictures, post them to Twitter, hashtag explore classroom, uh, tag Nacho Education. We'd love to see pictures of classrooms in action. All right, uh, let's get things moving to the main event. So really excited today to be joined by Dr. Tierney Tees. She's a National Geographic Explorer, Marine Biologist, Research Associate at the California Academy of Sciences and an independent filmmaker. She serves on the board of Think Beyond Plastic, a global leader in advancing solutions to plastic pollution through innovation and entrepreneurship. So current projects include tracking marine megafauna with satellite tags to reduce bycatch, uh, quantifying the role nature plays in human well-being uh, and environmental decision-making, and producing media on long-term solutions to plastic pollution. So Tierney, it is always so awesome when we can steal your time. You are a veteran of Explore Classroom. We love having you and we're excited to have you joining us uh, again today. All righty. Well, so can everyone hear me? Wave if you can hear me. Yay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm so happy that you tuned in today, and I'm super excited to talk to you about plastics and the ocean. And I know sometimes it can be sort of overwhelming because plastic is everywhere. Um, but I, I feel quite hopeful because I think it's really an opportunity for us to rise to the challenge and to innovate and to come up with great solutions. And we need everybody on deck. We need all hands on deck for this solution. So, um, so everyone has a role to play and everyone's familiar with plastic. So um, I thought I'd start, I put together a couple, um, a couple images um, to sort of walk through why I got so interested in this issue. Um, and then why it's the big issue, um, a short film that I did that traces the journey, the complicated journey of marine plastics from the viewpoint of a little tiny seahorse toy that was actually captured in a trawl net in the Mediterranean by a group that I work with, the Tara Ocean Group. And then um, after we come out of the film, which is about seven minutes, then um, I'm just gonna show some fun solutions and open it up for questions. All right, sound good? All right, so now I'm gonna um, share my screen, and we'll go into the into the images. All right, so here I go. Okay, so you guys can see this. All yeah? right, looks All right. good. This is one of my favorite images of um of a, of the magazine because it really <laughs> it gets that a lot, doesn't it? Looks like an iceberg but it's actually a plastic bag. Um, so I am enamored of the ocean. I love being in the water. And one of my favorite creatures is the giant ocean sunfish. Um, it, it just drew me to it because it was shaped so funny. And that drew me into the ocean and becoming a marine biologist. And, and from that, I've done a lot of different things in addition to, to tracking this crazy, goofy looking fish through the world ocean. Um, I'm also a coach for the Geo Challenge. Um, well, I have been in the past, um, <laughs> and I and I I also um, advise the Geo Challenge, which is a great new competition that National Geographic is putting forth for middle schoolers to come up with real world solutions to problems. This year, as in last year, it's tackling plastics, and um, some really really amazing um, solutions coming up there. So if your school doesn't know about it check out the geo challenge, especially if you're middle schoolers, fifth grade to eighth grade. Um, so I do um, expeditions for geographic in all sorts of different places. This is in Belize, where um, in Central America, where we see a lot of trash washing up. And with the students, we do beach cleanups and we make art projects. 
And um, it just really drove home how ubiquitous this problem is. Even, you know, the animals make the best they can. This is a little hermit crab that instead of a mollusk shell has taken up re residence in a little thick um, pen, pen cap. So, you know, we, we, it doesn't just make our beaches unsightly. It really changes the habitats for so many animals in the ocean. So it's a big problem. We've got, um, you know, we've produced about 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic. And you can, it's hard to wrap your head around that, but that's like 25,000 Empire State Buildings or 822,000 Eiffel Towers, <laughs> a billion elephants. So it's a lot of weight, a lot of weight. Um, and we used to send a lot of our recycling and a lot of our plastic overseas to places like China. But just last year, China said they've had enough of it. The National Sword Program, they said we're, they're not accepting our waste. So we really need to figure out how to deal with the waste that we're creating here in this country without sending it off overseas. Um, it's, it's it's really a big problem in the ocean as well. So what flows off of our land um, flows into the ocean, and then it goes into different parts of the world. So so the ocean connects everything, and we can't just go out and clean up the ocean without stopping everything that's flowing into the ocean first. So those are some of our big issues: is to reduce the amount of plastic waste we're creating. Um, you might think, well, wouldn't animals learn not to eat plastic? It doesn't help their digestive system. But a funny thing happens. When the little particles get into the ocean, they get coated with algae. That algae, when the sun hits them, creates a chemical called dimethyl sulfide. And that, and that wafts up into the, into the air. When seabirds smell that, it smells like food. So, you know, they... It, it's it's deceptive in that way. So that's one reason why seabirds eat a lot of this stuff because it smells like food to them. Um, a problem is, is that when we put the plastic into the ocean, it breaks down into these tiny little micro, micro um, plastics. And there are so many pieces of this. There's actually 500 times more pieces of microplastics than there are stars in our galaxy. That's kind of a mind-blowing fact. but um, So that's why it doesn't make much sense to tr go out there and try and clean it all up. We've got to stop it from getting out there in the first place. Um, so if you ask me, do you prefer plankton or plastic? Well, I prefer, um, I prefer plankton over plastic any day. Um, so so um, I made a short film that traces this journey that plastics make and where did plastic come from in the first place and that's what this film will um will tell you let me let me let me know if the sound um if the sound levels are okay all right so we're going to start it now and the first image in the film is actually a plastic cap mural that um was made by my kids elementary school 16,000 plastic caps okay here goes You might think I'm too stiff to travel, but trust me, I'm on a wild ride. It started out pretty carefree. I thought I was in good hands. Emma was my best friend. But this time, I wasn't coming back. I met the most amazing creatures in the sea. Drifters, like me. They call themselves plankton. This was a pulsating galaxy with living spaceships 
riding the currents. I noticed more and more static pieces, though. Colorful chunks floating far out at sea. We got all tangled up at the surface. He met the jaws of a silver giant. collecting plastic on the beach in an international call to action. That's how I ended up here with 16,000 plastic caps. Art beats trash, that's for sure. I don't belong in a landfill or the sea, but I'll still be around in a few hundred years. Okay. 
Okay. So that gives you a little bit of a um a, a little bit of insight into where plastic comes from and um and during that fossilization process that happens over millions of years, it becomes inedible. But there's lots we can do um, to, to reduce our use of plastic. I mean, first we, you know, we need to let our views be known to grocery stores. We, we, you can go to your grocery store and we don't want all our berries and plastic clamshells. There are alternatives to that. You can, so you can buy green packaging, always bring your own bag. Go to farmer's markets so you don't have to get everything packaged in plastic. If you can, do beach cleanups. Vote for bans on plastic bags and single-use plastic. And be aware that there are powerful groups that are trying to stop you from putting in bans. There are groups trying to stop you banning your bans. So be aware of that. Bring your own water bottles. Think about what you wear because 70% of what we wear is actually made from polyesters and rayon, I mean, polyesters and nylon that are petroleum products as well. Um, so I've gotten really interested in different kinds of clothing and harnessing the fashion industry to take up um, um, solving our plastics problem because those microfibers that come off our plastic clothing are a huge problem. But there are so many interesting solutions. This one company that I've been talking to called Bolt Threads. They actually genetically engineer yeast to create um, proteins that are like spider silk. And so they make new fabrics that yeast make by um, that are like spider silk fabrics. And they're making incredible fabrics from fungus, from the mycelia of fungus. So lots of, lots of um, fashion companies are looking at this. And we have big corporations that are realizing that they have played a huge role in the problem. Um, you know, the people who are making lots of money off single serving plastic are the corporations that make it like Coca-Cola and Nestle, but they're realizing this. And so they're making, um, they're making commitments to have their single serving plastic waste be recyclable, reusable, or compostable by 2025. I think we need to have it sooner than then. We're going to have a lot more plastic, so we need to keep our pressure up on the big corporations. And that means writing letters. That means telling the grocery stores who you want to see on your shelves. We all can play a part in voicing this. Um, in our own homes, what we wear, there's a great, um, there's a, a great website called 10 for the Ocean, Stopping Micro, micro Waste. And these little particles that come off our clothing that get into the food chain, there's some studies um, like Richard Thompson over in Plymouth, over in the UK, found that 80% of the muscles he, he was sampling had these little plastic microfibers in them. And then, of course, we're eating those. So really changing, um, we don't have to, we don't have to um, wash our clothes as many times as we do. We can hang dry them so they stay, they, the fibers stay stronger. Um, and we can um, wear organic cottons instead of polyesters. So there's a lot we can do on that front. Um, we really need to think about how the waste we make can be turned into a product of use instead of being just tossed into the landfill. And a great group to look at is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, who are proponents of a circular economy, where you make something and instead of it just turning into a waste product, the whole life cycle of whatever you make um, is taken into consideration. So that's um, the circular economy is definitely where we need to go in the future. And I always like to say, um, we like to say this at Think Beyond Plastic, innovation, you know, creating these solutions, it's a journey. It's an adventuresome journey. It's an exploration not a destination. We're going to be, this is a work in progress. It's super exciting. Lots of people working on it. And um, like lowly straws, they've made these straws that you can eat. Or, you know, the snap packs on Carlsberg, you can actually recycle those or, or bring them back to the company. We have to think more the way a natural ecosystem works. Like when a tree dies in the forest, and it falls to the forest floor, as it rots, it 
creates nutrients for new trees to grow. They're called nurse logs. This is a picture of a nurse log. And, and in its decay process, it's feeding, feeding the soil, feeding the rest of the forest ecosystem so that new life can grow instead of just a dead end. So if we get that kind of mindset when we create our new products, that's, that's the future. And I just hope that when, you know, when my kids are, are growing up and, and they get into their, into their middle age, they can say to me, Mommy, remember, remember back when we were little and there was so much plastic on the planet? Remember how we cleaned it up? Remember how we came up with these solutions? Boy, I'm really glad we acted when we did because now look at where we're at. And that's my dream for the future is that my kids can say that when they're my age or sooner. <laughs> All right. Well, so I'm going to um, click out of this and I'm going to open it up and we can talk to you guys. Okay. Right. Stop sharing. Well, Tierney, that is a good dream to have. I think a lot of people share that dream. Um, thank you so much for sharing that video with us. That was an awesome little documentary. And thanks for sharing some of those solutions. Because it is good to know that yeah, they're... I'll, I'll... I was going to say, it is good to know that the organizations are paying attention and they're, they're trying to do something now. Some of them anyways. Yeah, some of them are. I mean, they need constant pressure, you know, but um, if the consumer is saying that they don't want to buy everything wrapped in plastic, I mean, like bananas, why wrap bananas in plastic? They come in their own, <laughs> in their own wrapper. Um, then, they, then, you know, if enough people start squawking, they will listen. We shouldn't, it shouldn't all be on us to clean up the trash. The people who are making the single serving, they need to change. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but I will mention on the, um, on the film, it's also a TED Ed lesson. So there's questions and teachers, if you, you can um, assign that as, a, as an assignment, as a TED Ed lesson, it's a whole um, lesson plan with lots of resources in it. Very cool. Tierney, why don't you share me a link afterwards and I can pass it on to the classrooms. I will, I will. Oh, there's one thing I wanted to show you guys that I just discovered. Um, it's a fun activity you can do, making your own beeswax um, wrappers instead of wrapping everything in, um, in plastic. You can make your own. Have you guys seen these, these beeswax wrappers that um, you can use instead of, instead of um, soaping? Well, you can just buy pine rosin and beeswax and jojoba and you melt it in your um, in a in a double boiler and put a bandana in, and you could make your own cool beeswax wrappers. And so this weekend I'm doing that with my kids, and I'll send this to Joe. It's a little how-to guide, super fun activity, and terrific Christmas present. All and right. another show and tell. <laughs> one, one more other show and tell. If you do a beach cleanup. You can take all that trash and make really super fun monsters out of it. These are all, this is what I did with a, with a bunch of school groups. And we named them all. We took all the beach trash and they all have funny names. We make them into different animals. And then we um, went to Kinko's and made this laminated poster and put it up at the school. And everyone was very excited to show off the, the crazy monsters they made out of the beach trash they picked up. And whenever I travel, I always carry my little kit, my travel kit, which helps me reduce, you know, because traveling, oh my gosh, it's hard to, it's hard when you're traveling to say no to plastics. But I always carry my trusty water bottle if I have tea, my thermos. And then when I carry snacks in a reusable bag and my reusable cup and my reusable utensils right here and straw it's just always with me whenever i travel so i don't have to be polluting when i when i go abroad all right <laughs> all right excellent perfect well before we meet some of our camera classrooms i want to give a couple shout outs on youtube uh we've got lots of classrooms tuning in right now i want to give a shout out to some great two threes with mrs carr in shelburne ontario shout out to mrs bowen's class uh, they're hanging out with us. Where are they? Oh, there they are in Kingston, Ontario. 
We have someone tuning in in Romania. Very cool. Thanks for joining in. Um, Mrs. Van Nata's grade eights in San Diego. Big shout out to some grade five Spanish students with Mrs. Reed and Mr. Shelton's class. They're hanging out in Benicia, uh, California, grade four fives. Thanks everyone for joining us. I'll keep an eye out for your questions. But for now, let's meet some of our live classrooms on camera. Let's start out. Let's see. Let's go to, there we go. Let's go to Toronto, Ontario, Canada to start. Um, Mrs. Eyre has 80 students hanging out in the gym with us today, Tierney. So let's turn their microphone on and see how loud they can be. That's always fun to do. Let's see. <laughs> hey, hi, friends. Hi. How are you doing? No friends and stop. That's not the way we conduct ourselves. Get ready for questions. Tierney, may we ask a couple questions? Is it questions? Absolutely. Awesome. Does anybody have a thoughtful mind up question about ocean plastic or plastics following that talk by Tierney? So, shh. So you can introduce yourself. Okay, so right here is the camera. So Tierney, we have Colleen. Would you like to introduce yourself in your class? Hi, I'm Colleen. I am a, a grade six in a six five French immersion classroom. And uh, my question is, what do you think, well, where do you think the plastic will be in five years? <clears throat> well, well, plastic going to be in five years? Well, it's still going to be with us. Plastic doesn't biodegrade. So um, we have, we will have even more plastic trash in five years. But in five years, I'm hoping that there'll be, we will have made advances in um, coming up with new kinds of materials to replace plastics. There's all sorts of alternatives being explored from fungus to algae to um, genetically engineered bacteria. Um, so there's all sorts of ways that we can come up with ways to, re um, to replace plastic and stricter regulation. So there are rules against plastic bags. San Francisco, you can't have plastic water bottles. Um, corporations are starting to feel the heat of people not wanting them to keep cranking out all these single serving plastic things. So I think in five years, we're gonna see some big shifts. It's on the radar. It's definitely on the radar around the world. So um, five years is a short amount of time, but we can accomplish so much in a short amount of time, especially if you guys keep complaining about it <laughs> and keep setting an example going to your grocery stores with your reusable bag and telling the grocery store you don't want to have to buy everything in a plastic clamshell um, making sure that they have a bulk section so that you can use a reusable bag and get things in bulk instead of buying them in these single serving little tiny plastic wrappers so I think we're going to have great progress we still have a long road to go, but it'll be fun. <laughs> All right. Thanks for that great question to start us off, Mrs. Ayers' class. We're going to come back to your group because I want to jump to another live classroom. This time we're going to go to Mrs. Uh, Scala's class. They're grade fives who are joining us from Chad's Ford, Pennsylvania. Let's get that microphone turned on. How are we doing, grade fives? How are we? Good. 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 Okay, tell them your name. Um, I'm Kyle Dewey. <laughs> and then what's your question? Hi, Kyle. Hi. Um, my question is, what area in the world is most affected with plastic? Oh, well, the whole world is affected with plastic, but there are five main regions. Um, certainly, um, Asia is, um, is the continent that's getting the largest amounts of plastic. Um, but we're we're all we're all affected. We have um. There's a great issue. The National Geographic issue has um talked about the main rivers that 
that are pouring plastics out into the ocean. Um, so ocean-wise, we have you know one of the one of the hardest hit countries is Indonesia. Lots of islands and lots of lots of waste coming off Indonesia, off the coast of, of China, Southeast Asia, these areas. Certainly um, Central America. Um, uh, wherever you have areas where there's not a lot of cleanup um, before before trash gets to the coastline. So, but unfortunately, once um, once the plastic's out there, then it it gets concentrated into the gyres of the ocean. So you've got these circular um, these circulation patterns in the ocean that sort of concentrated into the middle, and every ocean basin has now a big garbage patch. You might have heard, have heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but that's actually in every single ocean basin. Um, so, so um, it's a global it's a global problem, which means that everybody can can play a part in the solution. But um, but certainly the largest amounts of plastic trash we find in Asia. Yeah. All Good right. Question. Another great question. I'm going to take a quick moment and jump online. Um, this is, there we go. Mrs. Shelton's class is wondering. So we talked about uh, trash going into the ocean, plastic waste. Do you have any idea how much plastic is picked up um, maybe from beaches each year? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I know that we have a California Coastal Cleanup Day that picks up, um, you know, tons of plastic every they, they do it once a year in September this month and um, but then there are beach cleanups that Surfrider does pretty much every month if not bi-monthly and the total tally from this country I don't know the answer to that question that's a really good question um, and how that would translate across the planet how much is picked up I don't know that's a great question I will try to find that out. How much is picked up in beach, in beach, um, beach coming? Because it's actually a difficult one because there's lots going on and sometimes they don't make it into a, a global portal. We do have these annual events that, that, um, that do a tally, but, um, and the California Coastal Commission would, would have all those numbers for how that has switched every year and how it's gotten bigger. Um, depending on the volunteer effort, but um, but that's a good question. I think I can send Joe some links that would have the answers too after we get off. Yeah, sounds good. We can definitely do that. Uh, yeah, perfect. I'm going to check in now with Mrs. Fusco's class. They are there. We go. They're joining us from Algonquin, Illinois, Grade Four class. Let me test that microphone. See how it's going. Can you guys hear me, Grade Fours? Oh, I see them waving like crazy, but the microphone's not working. Mrs. Fusco, do you want to type me a question into the chat sidebar? And I'll keep an eye out for it. But I can see you guys waving like crazy, so I know you can hear us. That's good. While we wait for that question, though, we'll go to Mrs. DeWerf's class. There's some great eights hanging out with us in Taylorville. I believe that's in Illinois as well, but they'll correct me if I'm wrong. No question. Uh, let's turn that microphone on. How are we doing, grade eights? Hi. Hi. Oh, hi, grade eight. Hi, you guys. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Has most of the micro. Here. Sorry, can you repeat that one oh, more I... time? We lost that. <laughs> <laughs> Has most of the microplastic research been only focused on marine ecosystems? Or is there some research being done on freshwater ecosystems? Ah, that is another really good question. There is a lot of research being done in freshwater um, systems. The limnologists um, are looking at that. I, of course, am most familiar with the marine side of things. Um, but we do, have, um, we do have various explorers at National Geographic that are looking at the freshwater as well. As well, they should, because um, a lot of this, you know, is a lot of microplastics are coming out into the ocean from rivers. Like, for instance, here in where I live in Monterey Bay on the coast of California, um, 
the microplastics that come out of my washing machine and into my water system then go down to the waste treatment plant and all the solid waste gets consolidated into sludge and then that sludge gets turned into compost for fields. They heat it up to get rid of the pathogens. And so then that sludge, but that sludge has all the microfibers because we do reverse osmosis and um, we really get it concentrated down. Um, that sludge then gets sent over to another part of Monterey Peninsula, Salinas Valley, where it gets spread on the field as compost fertilizer. So then, but it contains those microfibers. So, so instead of going out into the ocean, it goes onto the fields. But then when the rains come, the rains put it into the Salinas River, it's in the fresh water, and then it heads down to the ocean as well. So it makes this circuitous journey. Um, and so, of course, we need to know what's in the fresh water because the ocean's downhill from everything. So there are, there are various groups looking at um, microplastics in the Great Lakes, in the Mississippi River Delta, and um, I can send you some links to those as well if you like. Um, but that's definitely, that's a great question because, you know, the ocean's downhill. Where is it coming from? It's coming, it's flowing off the freshwater ecosystem into the ocean. It's not really coming from the ship. It's coming from the land. Yeah. So it's a great question. I will send a link. Okay. Perfect. So, Mr. Fuse was well, coming up with great questions. They yeah. always do. No question. Uh, Mrs. Fuse was <laughs> asked sent me their question, and they're wondering what made you want to become a marine biologist. Oh. Oh, now who, who, this this classroom. Where are they from? Uh, this is Mrs. Fusco's class. Uh, we just tried to grab them, but their mic was acting up. They're in Algonquin, Illinois. Oh, in Illinois. Okay. Why did I want to become a marine biologist? Well, why not? <laughs> We've got 99% of the planet is the 99% of the available living space on this planet is in the ocean. And we've explored very little of it with our own eyes. There's so much animal creativity. So I'm an animal lover. I am, I've got a dog and a, and a cat and I've always loved animals. I've always loved biology. I've always loved studying the natural world. And when you put your head underwater, it is just a whole new galaxy of life. And and it changes all the time when the tides go in and out. It's a constant living kaleidoscope of life. And um, it just entranced me. I, I think I decided I could become a marine biologist um, in college, as a career in college, when I had a chance to go to um, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia and um, and just see how how amazing the undersea world was and how we have so much still to learn just in the plankton itself. We don't even know who's eating whom in the plankton. We don't even know who lives out there. We've, we've described a million species, 1.3 million species on this planet, but we predict there's 10 million species there that still have to be described, still have, we, and, and describing is one thing but really understanding how they work in their ecosystem, that's another thing. So for a biologist, the ocean is unlimited, unlimited lab space. <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't ask for a better place to study. So for me, it was kind of, why not? <laughs> All right, well, I'm sold. I think uh, those are some awesome points, especially, uh, you know, there is so much left out in our ocean to explore and discover. It really is an exciting time. Uh, to think about a career, especially in marine biology. Um, and so needed, too. Uh-huh, absolutely. Uh, Mrs. Wolf's class, Idaho, uh, grade five, six is joining us. Let's get that microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, Idaho? How are we doing, guys? Yeah! We're very excited to... Hi, Idaho. <laughs> also watching from Boise, Idaho, and here's our question. Okay. Hi, I'm Meadow, and uh, our question is, what are the most harmful plastic items found in the oceans, and what solutions are already being created to eliminate them? Ah, the most harmful plastic 
That is, um, well, we certainly hear a lot about plastic bags because they look sort of like jellies, right? And they get stuck they get stuck in the digestive systems of all sorts of animals that mistake them for food. So um, that's one. And of course, there are lots of plastic bands, that plastic bag bands that have been enacted all over the world, from Rwanda in the deepest part of Africa to, um, you know, to states throughout the United States. So that's one solution that we see. And now you see a lot more people bringing their bags to the grocery store. Um, but a, you know, a really big problem are, are just when um, polycarbonate, which is number seven on your recycling, you know, each one of those numbers underneath on your recycling refers to a different kind of poly polymer, a different kind of um, plastic. They all have different recyclability. Um, PET, um, polyethylene is number one, and that's quite easily recycled. That's the thin plastic water bottles. So, those can be fairly easily recyclable, but they break down into these little tiny microparticles, which is the problem. So um, one of the most toxic ones is, is number three, PVC, um, which, is, which is hard to, to recycle. Polycarbonates have different chemicals in them, like um, phthalates and bisphenol A. So number seven is a real, a real bad one in terms of leaching out additional chemicals. Um, I can I can send you a listing of all the different polymers, how recyclable they are, as well as um, you know what what's being done is a work in progress. Like I said, it's a it's a journey, um, innovating to replace the different kinds of polymers. But there are groups that are coming up with ways where you can take all the plastics and put them all together. And um, there, there are machines and chemical processes that can sort out the resins, you know, the different polymers. Because that's the problem with the recycling. All these different, different kinds of plastics together make it, make it difficult to, like, create um, a clean, unified product to reuse. Maybe I'm getting into the weeds with you. <laughs> Maybe this is getting a little too detailed. But these are some of the complications. That, that we deal with, because plastic is not just one material. Plastic is many different kinds of polymers that have different material properties. So that's why there's not going to be one solution. There's going to be lots of different solutions, lots of different ways to innovate. Um, some plastic needs to be flexible. Some needs to be stiff. So, And those are all different kinds of resins and polymers. Um, but I think it would be helpful if I sent you a little, I have a handout. That, um, that talks about all the different resins, the one, two, three, four, five, you know, the things in the underneath on the, the, um, the containers and which ones are more recyclable than others. I can, I can send your, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to Joe and maybe he can post that. Yeah. All but right. That's a sounds great good. Question. Think... We, we need to get into the weeds and into the details, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Great question. Great point. Even though it says recyclable on the bottom doesn't necessarily mean your city has the facilities uh, to actually recycle it. So that's important too. Totally true. Totally true. All right. We're going to squeak in one more question from Mrs. Ayers group because they have a nice big group in the gym. So let's get that microphone on. If you guys want to squeak one more and I think we can squeeze it in. I'd love to. I have a question if nobody else has. No, we do have some questions. Um, okay. It's hard to pick because we have quite a few. I will pick you. What? Do you do you have a mind off a great question? Yeah, okay. So you can introduce yourself. Hi, hi, I'm Taya and I'm in grade six. My question is if plastic is so bad for the environment, then why did we make it? Oh mm. I am so glad to, I'm so glad you asked that because plastic, I don't want to demonize plastic. Plastic has helped us reach the modern age, especially in medicine, where we need to have things sterile and single use. Plastic has a huge role in our society, a huge beneficial role. It's when, it's, um, it's when we make things that we don't really need to make out of plastic, that's when the problem arises. So, um, I mean, just think of all the really great things that are made from plastic that it's lightweight, it's durable, 
and it should be viewed as more of a precious material than a throwaway material because it is precious and it has it's helped medicine it's helped the car industry it's helped the food industry um but we make things out of plastic that don't need to be made out of plastic now just for our own convenience so we've kind of gone overboard and we need to um and the people who are making lots of profit from that are the corporations that are making the single serving um packages so we need to tell them we don't want them to we don't need that convenience um they think that we're asking for that convenience um so plastic is a precious precious material and we should treat it as such and not just toss it away but figure out how to reuse it and how to reduce it um, to, to the things that we really need it for. There's a really interesting group called Precious Plastic, um, and they have machines that are super cool. I can send you a link to them. It's a movement that um, I just met with them in Ireland um, last month, and they have these machines where you can take your plastic waste and you can put it into the machine and they can create all sorts of different things out of it, new bowls and new um, cups, and you can take the plastic and and make it into something new, precious plastic. I'll send you a link to that, too. Um, so don't think about, I mean, plastic is not this horrible thing. We owe a lot to plastic. It's been very beneficial, but right now we need to rethink how we're using it. All right. Well, teachers, keep an eye on your inboxes because I will send all those links your way. Uh, I want to give a huge shout out to our classrooms today. Thank you, as always, for your thoughtful questions and for spending a little time hanging out with us today. And Tierney, thank you so much for spending some time with us today, for sharing, uh, you know, what you've learned and solutions you found around the world. It's always great to have you. Yep. Yep. Lots of solutions out there. We can all play a part. All right. Well, the last thing I'll do is I'm going to unmute all the microphones. So boys and girls, if you want to get loud, big goodbye and thank you to Tierney. And then we'll sign off. Thank you. Thank you. All right. They absolutely love that part and they're so good at it. Uh, Tierney, again, thank you so much. We have tons more plastic events uh, coming up on uh, Explore Classroom over the next uh, couple of weeks. If you check out Nat Geo Dot org. Look under education. You can find what's coming up. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much, everyone. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.